Can you make a bunch of money and still make a difference? Are rich people greedy and evil? Today on the Ellery Well Show, I'm going to talk with Cole Hatter. You're going to get to just eavesdrop on our conversation here in just a minute, but we're going to talk about how your view of money might be keeping you from having any. And in today's episode, it's my pleasure to share this conversation with Cole because he started the Thrive Make Money Matter conference. I've been twice The third year is coming up here in just a few weeks at the end of September of 2012, and it is one of the best conferences that I have ever been to, not just for motivation, not just for uh, business advice, and not just for the caliber of people that I have met and connected with by attending this conference, but because of all of those Thanks. Cole has a message. He's clear about his message, and he wants to show you and I both how we can make a difference in the world by, I don't want to say putting our money where our mouth is, but by having a purpose in our life and having a purpose in our business. I'll throw up the intro and then let you eavesdrop on the conversation between me and Cole Hatter, the founder of the Thrive Conference. And there are a few links that Cole mentions throughout the episode. If you want to check those out, you can go directly to the show notes page at elderywells.com slash Cole Hatter. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs who gave up their six-figure salary and fancy office to start a business, and I wasn't selling lemonade to my neighbors when I was seven. I wasn't born an entrepreneur, and I never laid awake at night dreaming of owning my own business. My name is Ellery Wells, and I was forced to make a decision. Welcome to the Ellery Wells Show, where we talk with real entrepreneurs about real problems that they're facing and real solutions on how they are overcoming obstacles, achieving their goals, and making a difference in the world. If you're an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, this is the place to be to help you start, build, or grow your business. We've all been told to follow our passion, but how do we validate our ideas and determine if there's a market for what we want to sell? What if I could show you how experts and professionals pre-sell products, determine market size, and decide which products to create and which ones should be put on the shelf for later? If you're not interested and you decide to not enroll in the program, nothing bad will happen. (laughs) Wait, what? Yeah, nothing bad will happen to you if you don't enroll. But nothing good will happen either. If you don't enroll in eight weeks to exit, Two things are guaranteed to happen. First, you'll always wonder, what if? Second, you'll go back to work on Monday and nothing will have changed. Your dreams will be put on hold. You'll have a few extra dollars in your pocket and you won't have put in any effort to do something amazing with your life. You've already spent plenty of time debating if eight weeks to exit is worth your time and money. And that's just fine. But remember, doing nothing leads to exactly where you are now. How does that sit with you? Don't put your dreams on hold. Haven't you waited long enough? Head over to 8weekstoexit.com for more information and to become a student. I saw your post on Facebook. How was your interview with uh, Entrepreneur on Fire with John? Was it good? It was good. I'm excited to share that one with the rest of the world. I have an interesting history with John, not a bad one, just an interesting one with John going back to 2014. So that we That's didn't funny. get into. So it. do I. We were at uh, New Media Expo. In, I, yeah, we were at New Media Expo. And it was this, it, I talked about it in my book as this kind of magical event where all of these online business owners were kind of fictional. You know, you never met them before. They were all online. And I go to this conference and I met Pat Flynn for the first time. I met John for the first time, Cliff Ravenscraft, the first time. I don't know if you know Cliff. And all of these, like, you know, online businesses, scammy and evil, and, you know, you're going to get ripped off. And it turned it into this, like, these are real people, you know, getting to meet them for the first time. So it was a really cool time in my life. And it happened to be three weeks before I got fired from my job. So, Oh, p- perfect. Yeah. So, well, the first question that I want to ask you is, is how you would respond if someone says money can't buy happiness. Awesome. You know, my, my immediate response is if you think money can't buy happiness, you're shopping in the wrong place. 
Um, I just just got my TEDx video back where I talked on that exact subject. And, you know, there's an interesting relationship we as people have with money. If you look at it over over the years and it can be a powerful thing. Right. And some people misquote the Bible and say that the love of money is the root of evil. Uh, excuse me, money is the root of all evil, but it's actually the love of money is the root of all evil. So, mm-hmm. so there's even some misquotes, and uh, some people feel a certain emotional way about it. But the bottom line is, all money is is an is an object or a vehicle that gives us options, and that's all there is to it. And uh, I believe that money exposes you, or it's a magnifying glass. And so if you take someone like Mother Teresa and put a million bucks in her pocket, she could have continued the work she was doing without needing money, but that would have given her more options to do other things that require writing a check. And so I'm always very clear to say your human worth has nothing to do with your net worth at all. Having more money does not make you a better person, but what it does for a fact is it gives you more options. So those options can include better health care for your children, a safer neighborhood for your family, a nicer lifestyle if you choose to, and giving back in a greater way also if you choose to. It literally just gives you options. So to your question, some people say money can't buy happiness. What do I say? I say that they're shopping in the wrong place. If you chose to, you could use your money to impact other people's lives in whatever way resonates with you. It could be animals. Maybe you're an animal lover, and if you had extra money, you could do something about the shelter in your, in your local community of, of feeding the animals, whatever it is, right? Whatever resonates deeply with you, give you more money and it gives you more options to do that thing. And uh, I guarantee that you can buy your happiness essentially by writing a check and impacting someone or something that is deeply meaningful to you. I wanted to start with that question and it was kind of a loaded question. I, I don't want to say I knew how you would answer it, but after having attended Thrive twice and having that amazing experience. And we'll get to that, the, the conference itself. I And I, I did see somebody shared it on Facebook. Maybe it was in the Thrive group or something. I was scrolling through it a minute ago. And actually, <laughs> I, I was stalking you on Instagram and you saw, uh, if, if anybody wants to see it, Cole just shared on his Instagram account. is either Instagram or Snapchat, colehatter.com slash TEDx. And if you want to see that, I have not seen it yet, but I I wanted to ask you that question early, Cole, because I knew it was kind of not a softball question and maybe get somebody grabbed in early because I'm I really enjoy that part of your story and or that part of your talk that you do at Thrive. And whenever you said that the first time, I was like, you know what, that is that's that's so true. And I've been telling my clients and people who listen to my show that you can't have a positive view of money if you say things like filthy rich or greedy, you know, insert someone with money term. Right. You won't go after subcon my my degrees in psychology, so I think about things a little bit like that. You can't go after something that you automatically associate with something negative. Totally. And it's it's true. Well, I'm glad you you know that you're a psych major. There there is a lot of psychology behind money. And like I was saying, it's some of it's inherited through uh, family beliefs, maybe grandma and grandpa told you or whatever it is. And, you know, our parents and our grandparents grew up in a very different time than we did, especially those living here in America of, of Vietnam Wars or even World War II, et cetera. And so, or even the depression, depending on how old your grandparents are and how old, how old you are. And so I just think that everyone needs to step back for a second and I'll give a brief one minute history of money. Back in the day, we didn't have any of it. It was all based on trade. So if you and I knew each other thousands of years ago, there was no form of currency or commodity or fiat-based money. It was just, hey, you have something I need, so we had to trade for it. These are like the caveman days, right? And it was it was this trade system. Eventually, we realized that that became somewhat inconvenient because if there was something you had that I needed and there was nothing I had that you wanted, there was no fair trade and I could perish because I needed your spear to go hunting and you wanted nothing of mine, right? So we started digging precious minerals and jewels out of the earth, and that's called commodity-based money like gold, silver, etc. And we started using these because it was more universal. If I wanted your spear now to go hunting, I didn't need something that you wanted. I would just give you the appropriate amount of gold. Well, as we progressed and evolved as people, we realized that carrying around gold and silver and diamonds and rubies was inconvenient as well. So we started leaving those things in the bank and creating these little paper IOUs. This was the this was the origin of the banking system where we would leave our gold in a protected place called a bank and I would start issuing you IOUs and then you could go to the bank with Kohl's IOUs and get my gold that way so I could leave the gold protected. And that was what's called fiat money and that's what we've now globally adapted today. Our 
our dollars here in America are actually not made out of paper. They're made out of cotton, so that's why they don't ruin when you wash them. But the bottom line is they have no value. They once upon a time represented something of value. And when you look at the history of where it all comes from, it was just a matter of trade. And so even to today, people have this huge emotional and psychological attachment and feelings towards money, but all it was ever invented for was a more convenient way to trade. So the question back again is, what are you trading your money for? Have no emotion to it. Desire it because it gives you more options for trade, period. You also used a word before called options, and I I was driving down the road the other day. And my wife and I were going to – I think we went to Saltgrass Steakhouse last Wednesday, and we were thinking – about just okay how much is how much is dinner going to cost not in a like can we afford it kind of way because we shouldn't have been gone into saltgrass if we couldn't but i would that term options popped into my head and, and i guess i heard that the first time maybe when you shared it a couple of years ago but seeing money as, as okay i have i have 10 options i can go get maybe a burger and fries or if I had 100 options, I could go get a steak and a baked potato. And seeing money that way, and then it also gives you kind of that gl- that clinical detachment to, okay, I, ju- I just want more options. And I, you shouldn't associate money with things that are negative. But if you look at it as an option, I want more options. I'd like the option to buy an Audi A8, for example, or I think that's uh, the the new – addition to your collection all right oh the a8 the a8 the big old sedan that's a nice car but no yeah i've got the r8 that's a little race car i saw i saw chris uh your cousin saying that you guys were i don't know if you raced that against the the dodge viper that you have or you're just driving them together or something yeah chris uh chris is my general manager he's also my cousin and uh he had a great week in our business and i want to reward him so on a saturday morning i was like bro i need you over here right now and you know, he's expecting to have the weekend off. So he's like, are you kidding me? And I was like, dude, super important. Get to my house right now. <laughs> so he shows up like, what, bro? And I've got them both outside of my house on the driveway or uh, in front of my driveway lined up. And I tossed him the keys to the Audi and I said, let's go. And uh, he went and ripped around my Audi. I ripped around my Viper and we went for hours. It was fun. So there's more options, right? Exactly. Having the option to do that instead of having to take on the second second job i the reason why i'm spending money on or spending money spending time on on this subject of money is actually this came up in one of my mastermind calls yesterday and one of my clients and as do most of them she need she really needed to like triple or possibly quadruple her prices she was undercharging and i was telling her you've got to change how you think about money when you charge more and you're more profitable all of a sudden you could you could serve clients not necessarily locally but nationally or you know, spend more time and create more content and have and pay somebody to offsource some things that you're not fantastic about. But you have a very unique sense of or a way of thinking about money. And I don't know if it's a sensitive subject, Cole, or not. But I assume it's if if it is, just tell me. We can either cut it out or skip it. But I, your your wife is not from here. You mentioned how Americans have a sense of money or a view of money. How have you noticed someone from a different country who now lives here? Has her views changed or did you have to change the way that you thought about money when you guys got married? Yeah, so great point. And I actually talk about this from stage, so we can go there. Um, but yeah, my wife was born in Yugoslavia, actually Serbia, because Yugoslavia broke up in their civil war. And uh, although Serbia is, you know, it's not a third world country as a whole, she grew up in third world conditions. She was born on a farm, you know, in like ancient times, right? Like no running water, any of that stuff. And that was my wife's introductory introduction to the world she she farmed right or i guess she didn't her parents didn't she lived and then they immigrated over here for a better life and obviously things changed she now lives in orange county california and obviously has everything that you would expect an american to have and what's really interesting is it's almost like a a healthy but almost too far her culture she's very different now uh, obviously being my wife and and being investors we we you know uh, the way that we've survived or i guess i have as an entrepreneur for the majority of my 12 years is as an investor so of my 12 years of being an entrepreneur i've been with my wife eight of those right she met me right when i was just getting started and so she's has a, a healthier view of money now because we make money by investing it and you know leveraging dollars etc but 
the point is her culture, and I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with this, and maybe it's even an, uh, it's it's healthy, but maybe too far is like they have no desire or value for it at all. There's there's no emotional attachment to it, which can be healthy because I don't think you should be emotionally attached, especially as an investor. It'd be very hard to write those checks to make those investments if I was emotionally attached to the outcome, right? Uh-huh. But to the point where like. I don't want to say it almost lack desire for pursuing their own greatness within business. My wife now is freaking a gangster little CEO. She basically runs Thrive, and it turns out that she's a better business person than I am. And that was just an evolution of our marriage and my businesses becoming gr- bigger than I could personally handle. And wifey stepping up to assist her husband has turned into – she's calling the majority of the shots when it comes to my event – And so she would have never pursued entrepreneurism because her culture says like, go get a little job, just be able to have enough and enough's enough. If if you've got a roof over your head and you've got a car that decent, you know, it runs and gets you from A to B and uh, you've got food in your fridge, then what more do you ask? You know, it's just greed. Like anything beyond that is greed. The other thing is they believe that responsibility is hard work. So I have this conversation with my wife's parents all the time that her dad has no interest in retiring because he believes retirement is a lazy American philosophy and literally wants to work himself to death. So there is some cultural background in hard work equals being responsible. However, working jobs that pay pay you basically just enough to survive is enough. And if you want anything more than that, like a second car or or a better job with more money, you're just being greedy. So it's so it's a healthy sense that they don't care about money, almost to an unhealthy level of staying in poverty, if that makes sense. That poverty mentality they grew up with. And so my wife's you know, obviously shifted her mindset in that now. And, but uh, her parents still very much are, you know, the hard, some of the hardest working people who I absolutely adore. It's really cool. I, I genuinely have a great friendship with my in-laws that the joke is always like, you can't stand the in-laws. We love them to death, but yeah, they, her mom and dad are going to work forever in jobs that are just giving them enough. I had a, a conversation a couple of weeks ago with one of my clients and she'd kind of been raised on the, just be happy with what you have mentality. And I think that's a really negative view of of the world to just be happy with. There, that's that's coming from a place of scarcity. That's that's coming from a place of we can't all prosper and succeed and do amazing things. And anyway, I, I what you said brought that up. But before I forget, I wanted to tell you, and hopefully you'll tell Sonia. You guys have done, or maybe it's her. She has done. Someone on your team has done an absolutely fantastic job of negotiating hotel room rates. I mean, you guys are less than half of some of the comparable conferences that I've been to in either the San Diego area or in the Vegas area. And that really shows that you guys want people to be able to attend. And I, I definitely want to spend plenty of time talking about the actual conference. But I wanted to tell you guys, thank you for putting in that time or whatever you guys did. Because it allows more people in the audience, not just the millionaires and the guys that are on stage that we'll talk about, but the the average guys, you know, just being able to access the quality of speakers and the quality of the environment. And this year we'll be at the Hard Rock and we're coming we're coming early. And I think by the time this goes live, it will be it might be a little bit too late unless you go and get a hotel room immediately, but we're going almost an entire week for $640. That's rad. Yeah, that's 100% my wife. I'll tell you exactly how we did it. My wife is a gangster negotiator. I had nothing to do with that room block. She did it all. And then the way we were able to pull it off is we took a larger food and beverage minimum. So I appreciate you acknowledging that, uh, how we got the rooms so cheap, knowing that there was probably more behind the scenes. And my wife and I stepped up and are paying – probably an additional 60%, so not quite double, but maybe 60% more than we needed to in our food and beverage minimum. The rest, the hotels make you spend money. Mm-hmm. Like if it's like, hey, all we want is water. That's it. I don't want to feed anybody. We don't want coffee, just water. They're going to like, cool, too bad. You owe us a minimum of XYZ food and beverage. And so we signed a contract for 60% more food and beverage spend. And at a place like Hard Rock, it's a lot of money. We're talking six figures. So six figures on food and beverage that we didn't necessarily need to, but as a leveraging chip, they lowered our room block as low as we did. So yeah, it's, it's exactly like you said, you're the first person to ever really mention that. I think maybe people just assumed that the hard rock was cheap that weekend or was just being negotiable, but yeah, we are personally paying 
tens of thousands more over six figures total in our food and beverage minimum. And in exchange, our room block is, uh, you know, incredibly low. So, so appreciate that. And because it's so low, like you said, it's, it's almost sold out now. Two of the nights are only Friday and Saturday have, as of recording this podcast, about 60 rooms available each. So 60 on Friday night and 60 on Saturday, but those will go quickly. I, uh, was at a conference with digital marketer in Orlando and I was talking to one of the guys, one of the core guys of digital marketer. I think, you know, some, I know, you know, John Dennis and John Dennis is one of their certified guys. Anyway, I was talking to one of the guys that started, that's the founder. And he was saying that anytime you go to do something like that at a hotel, it's sick just for a pot of coffee, like not even anything else is $60 for a pot of coffee. And it's just, it's just insanely expensive. Dude, hotels, I don't know how they sleep at night. Like literally, like you said, 60 bucks for a pot of coffee. They charge me per gallon and it's $90 a gallon. And it's like, that's dirt water. First of all, I think coffee tastes disgusting, but all it really is is dirt water. And so, so you're going to take water, sprinkle some bean dirt in it and now charge me $90 a gallon for that stuff. So yeah, in the event space for any of your listeners who are thinking of hosting their own event. I think it's basically criminal. Like I'm not saying that to try to be funny. I'm, I'm dead serious. It's kind of criminal. I mean, I was just doing a, I have my own mastermind that, that we open up at the Thrive event and uh, the mastermind also takes place in hotels. It's it's a much smaller uh, room, obviously. We're going to have a thousand attendees at, at uh, Thrive and we only have 50 people in my mastermind. And I am self-sufficient. I'm on projectors. I'm on white screen. I'm on speakers. So we get there and they want to, you know, hey, what? So it's like three hundred dollars a day for a projector. I was like, oh, I got that. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, then it's, uh, you know, X amount for speakers. I was like, no, no, no. You don't understand. I'm totally self sufficient. I need nothing from you. I'm just renting this space. And they came up to me and they're like, well, you have to buy something. I was like, well, I don't need anything. So here's what we negotiated. Of all the equipment I was using of my own that I owned, they charged me thirty percent of what it would have been if I had rented it. So they're like, okay, that projector would have been three hundred dollars a day for three days. That's nine hundred bucks. So you owe us three hundred dollars. And I, and they charged me for my own stuff thirty percent of what it would have been if I had rented it from their hotel. And I was like, you guys are freaking criminals. Like, how do you how do you sleep at night walking in here telling me I have to pay you to rent stuff I'm actually not even renting? And you think you're giving me a deal because I'm only paying 30%. So anyway, we don't need to rant about that. We don't need to take the podcast to the negative. But any of you who are doing live events in hotels, get ready for it because they seriously just try to try to get you everywhere they can. But as a serious question, you know, last when we were in San Diego, which you guys, again, it was a fantastic hotel right on the water, a fantastic rate for the hotel so, but we would go you know for lunch or something we would go across the street or you know to help with that to help it comp not compensate but to uh offset that extra 60 percent in order to get the rooms lower we should instead have our lunches and dinners at the hotel this time uh, sure well actually no no it, that's a whole nother uh, we don't even need to go there but no what money you spend there doesn't count it's what money i spend so as you know we have our vip dinner on friday night and so we're spending uh, quite a bit of money on that dinner and then bro we rent it out so if if anybody knows vegas it's famous for pool parties and if every venue in vegas the hard rock has the largest most famous pool party ever in the history of pool parties ever the weekend that we're there they are closing it to the public at 7 p.m. for a quote-unquote private event. And at 8 to midnight, 8 p.m. to 11 probably, but we have it till midnight, we rented their whole freaking pool. And it's going to be drinks and all that. So that's where a lot of the money is being spent too. But we've sucked at actually publicizing that. So I'm going to start sending a bunch of emails out to you guys that are coming to let you know. like It's going to be the biggest pool party ever, the whole Thrive Tribe. Like Not a single person from the public will be allowed in. It's a private event. For the whole pool, it's going to be sick. That's awesome. If you go to elleriewells.com slash attend thrive, you can see all of the speakers I still want to talk about, but there's a tab up at the top about location and venue and the dates for everything. And it just, it looks amazing. I've been to the Hard Rock once and uh, at that new media expo I mentioned before, Pat Flynn, Chris Ducker and Cliff Ravenscraft had a meetup at the, at the restaurant there. And that's really my only exposure to the hard rock, but it just looks absolutely amazing and a fantastic event. So let's talk about the conference a little bit because this, I know it's an important, obviously, 
uh, an important event in your life. But honestly, I think it was pretty important to me. But I and, and I want to just go through the kind of the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, but, I, but before we do that, I want to share uh, why why I think people miss the point of Thrive. And hopefully, it's all right that we go there, Cole, because Thrive's not for everybody. It's, right. A lot of people, but I see people in the, I, I talk to people in the bars and everything, and I don't know if you know this, Cole, but not everybody totally is in is in love with the event like some of us who have you know are just like all in. They because they miss one of the words in the tagline for Thrive. So the full name of the Thrive Conference is Thrive Make Money Matter. And the people who I talk to and have drinks with and they're like, Yeah, it's all right. I've seen this kind of stuff before, and I kind of want to just chop them right in the throat and say shut up. <laughs> say shut up because they they focus on the first two words, and it's make money. But I think of all of the words, either they're equally important or the last one is the most important, but it's making money matter. And if you focus on making money, you will – probably you you probably shouldn't come to thrive yes there are speakers like les brown yes there are speakers like cole and his wife sonia there's the one of the guys from the first season of shark tank there's ty lopez there's guys like jason gaynard who i've had on the podcast tucker max who's best-selling author i mean yes you will get access to hear all of those people but if you go for those reasons i don't think you will really enjoy thrive as much as i do or get the most value out of it what do you think about that yeah i think it's true um kind of how we open this thing up of you know money can buy happiness it just depends on depends on where you're spending it or investing it i should say you know that's what we focus on at thrive is like you said we have an all-star lineup uh people consistently message me and say like how do you do it they thought thrive one was a fluke they thought thrive two was a fluke but now thrive three being arguably the best speaker lineup we've ever had people like okay this isn't a fluke how are you pulling this off so we do bring in amazing people that will teach you straight up how to make money how they are making money we have two billionaires this year bro two billionaires are going to be on stage speaking so they're going to talk about business principles and how to do well in today's economy and and how to make money in the world today uh, but many of us, myself, my wife, and some of the other speakers focus on then how to make that money matter by creating what we call four purpose businesses that don't just make money, they make a difference. And so an example would be like Tom's Shoes. Every pair of shoes, this is how they started. Every pair of shoes Tom's sold, they give a pair away. And so what Blake Mikowski, the founder of Tom's, does with his money personally is his business to keep private. The business Tom's Shoes as a whole was just generous. It gave a pair away for every pair it sold. And so we teach people how to run their companies in that type of a business model so that uh, a couple of reasons from just the romantic side, you know, you're making the world a better place and whatever cause or initiative that your business is helping. I'll give you another example. There's Listen Headphones, L-S-T-N. It was started by a woman named Bridget and they're comparable to a Beats by Dre type headphone. They're premium headphones. Yet for every pair of listen that they sell, they give hearing aids to a child who can't hear. So you're at a store and you're like, hey, do I want Beats by Dre or do I want listen? It's going to sound the same on my ears. When I buy Beats by Dre, uh, you know, I guess Apple, I think, bought those. So Apple makes money. Or uh, if I buy listen, a kid somewhere is going to be able to hear because of my transaction. And so on the romantic side, you're making an impact. Uh, but then on the measurable side through metrics, there have been countless global reports and studies done that say that 91% of consumers will choose to do business with a company that has some type of a social cause or impact built into the business model than they would with a traditional name brand. And the millennials and then whoever's after them are are more – I don't want to call them tree huggers, but they're definitely more in in tune with making an impact and wanting to make a difference and pollute less and and give back more. And so that's all good. So that's our marketplace now. I mean, technically, I'm a millennial because it's 1980 to nine, uh, to 2000. I was born in 84, so I'm like an old millennial, whatever. But yeah, exactly. But the point is we are the marketplace. So I'm 33. 
and I'm at the age where people are targeting me for my dollars, you know, and, and the younger millennials, I guess, puts them down to like 17. So they're like the next spenders in the economy. And so if you want to be a smart business owner, you want to get ahead of trends. And regardless, if you're selling shoes, watches, purses, jewelry, a service, like you have a psych background, maybe you're a psychologist or a therapist or whatever. If you want to make money in the economy, you need to look at your marketplace. And the majority of the buyers are now Half of America's population is under the age of 30. Half of the America's population is under the age of 30. And so if that's your marketplace and 91% of them say, I will do business with somebody who gives back over someone who doesn't, then just from the business standpoint, it makes sense to run a for-purpose business model because you're capturing more market share. Blake Mikowski, when he thought of Tom's shoes, didn't have a better shoe than anybody else. He had a better idea. And he was making an impact, which is why he's now worth $380 million. So like the founder of Tom's. And so that being said, I could rant on this all day long. But to your point, Thrive teaches you marketing. It teaches you raising money. It teaches you actual business concepts because I don't want to just woo, woo, woo people and you know get them all excited and then send them out ill-equipped. It teaches you how to make money around a business model that makes a difference so that at the end of each quarter, you're not just looking at the bottom line of how you're you know, bottom line revenue grew, you're also looking at a very key metric of how much impact you make. And I love that. I love that for people running for purpose businesses, uh, what type of a social impact or, or world impact you're making is part of the metrics that you measure as a business and seeing how many lives you're impacting. And so I think that's important. Can we talk just a minute? I, I'm thinking, okay, Cole, you got a profitable business, you make some money, but my business isn't all that profitable. I don't know what I'm, you know, where I could take profit from. How have some of the people, if you want to use Tommy Barretts as an example, I had him and Nick over to the house and I never actually released the episode. So uh, the spoiler is they also talked about this, but how, how can a business today, like in the next maybe two or three weeks before Thrive, start thinking, okay, how am I going to put a purpose or how can I start adding in this giving back element into my business now? So there's three ways to implement a for-purpose business model that are the easiest to explain on a podcast. The first is giving away product and service, if it makes sense. So for Tom's Shoes, for example, they gave away their own pair. So you buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair away. And so that's like the one-for-one one model. Uh, you might not have those margins. You might say, Cole, if I gave, you know, if I sold a pair of shoes, and then gave a pair of shoes away, I'd go bankrupt. I don't have the margins. Well, you don't need to do the one for one. Maybe it's for every 10 pairs of shoes you sell, you give a pair away. And of course, you don't need to sell shoes. I'm just using that as an example. But let's just say you sell eyeglasses. And for every, you know, you want to help people who are blind have correctional surgery, and that's not cheap. Cool. Maybe it's for every 100 pair of glasses you sell, you fund the surgery for someone who's blind and out see. So just get creative. But there's the there's the actual, you know, giving away of product and services. Uh, the second option is, is money, which is what I was just talking about right there. And that's what Tommy did. Uh, Tommy and Nick have a pool company, like a swimming pool, not not shooting pool, a swimming pool company. And they raised their prices. And that increase in their prices didn't go into their pocket. It was donated. So they, they raised their prices across the board. And that extra income they didn't put into their general account to then pay their employees, their payroll, right, and then themselves. It went into a separate account where they partnered with uh, – darn, I can't think of the local charity uh, in, in Houston. But they partnered with a local charity that feeds 1,200 kids a day. And so just by a quick price increase and, and you know, one that makes sense, you, you know, they couldn't double their prices. Obviously, they would have priced themselves out of their marketplace. But a price increase that, that – still keeps them in business and competitive. I think it was only one or two percent uh, that they did personally. And and that might sound not like a lot. Well, it's it's enough to feed 1,200 kids a day. So clearly their business is large enough that one to two percent is a substantial amount of money. And so just that one to two percent price hike uh, or increase uh, is then 100% donated. So if you have an existing business or want to create a for-purpose business, uh, you can consider what you need to do within your margins to add a little bit of a buffer in there to be able to give it away. I'll use another example of Sevenly, started by a buddy of mine, Dale Partridge. They give $7 away on every item you buy from their uh, online store. I mean, they sell, they're an online retailer for merchandise like necklaces and watches and scarves and stuff. And so basically they as a company look at what their costs are uh, to import or, or buy these scarves and then what they need to mark them up for to be able to sell them online and be a profitable business. And what, let's just say they're buying the scarf for $12 and selling it for 22. They need to make 10 bucks. 
they'd actually sell that scar for $29 instead of $22 because they just added an extra $7 that they didn't necessarily need to be able to give that to charity. So it's called Sevenly, and for every item you buy, they give $7 away to charity. And so that's not coming out of their pocket. They're just adding that cost to their item and passing that to the consumer. And then the last option would be who you're employing. Uh, I met a gentleman who just got out of prison, actually. He did tax evasion, so nonviolent, nice guy, just didn't want to pay his taxes and got caught for it. And, you know, we all make mistakes. And while he was in prison, he worked in the kitchen feeding the other inmates. And he saw how bad the food was in prison. So he started manufacturing in prison his own granola bars with just the stuff, you know, he'd go and get honey and granola. And he was like making his own granola bars with what he could in the prison. And after he was done serving his time for tax evasion, he got out and he's since started a company called Prison Bars, uh, which is, it's awesome. Their, their tagline is, they are criminally delicious. And, um, and they're, I've eaten them. They're delicious. They're, they're, they're like a, a meal, repl- not a meal replacement, they're a granola, but they're more than a granola bar. They're like, they're like a, a quest bar or a, right? Like a, a protein bar. And his employees are all recovering convicts, people who served time for making a mistake, who are now out rehabilitated and trying to maintain employment. His company doesn't give away money and he doesn't give one bar away for every bar they sell, but he chooses to employ people who otherwise would have struggles being employed. And so those are three different business models of employing people like uh, veterans or whoever to make an impact to that community actually giving money away like Tommy does by building it into your prices or like Sevenly does or giving product away like Tom's Shoes does are three ways to adapt your existing business model to convert it to a for purpose like Tommy did. His pool his pool company has been around for over a decade. Or if you're thinking of starting a business now, to just incorporate that business model in. Before we do the, the who, why, when, where, and why, I want to tell everybody who's listening that the when you when you have that third word in the tagline when you have matter in the tagline i think that's kind of an important thing but you you attract at least the the repeat visitors or to to the conference you attract a certain caliber of people a certain type of people with a particular world view and i tell you that some of the nicest smartest uh just good people i have met through sitting in the audience at Thrive. Like we keep mentioning Tommy and, and Nick. Before Nick is actually the one that encouraged me to really follow up with with John Dumas for Beyond EO Fire. And he messaged it, we hadn't talked in months and he messaged me and said, Good luck today before the interview. So he had put that on his calendar. He had kept me accountable and he had pushed me for it. And I have gotten that kind of relationship from no other conference that I have ever been to. So the the people who come to this event are people who will change your life. And you would, you might think I'm going to click over here on this tab so I don't forget. But the you might think that it's just stupid money to come and hear people like uh, Jack Canfield who wrote chicken soup for the soul and gary vaynerch the general admin ticket is 297 the vip experience if you want to i i don't know if you still have those available or what the price will go up to but if you want to sit with ashley and me in the front couple of rows vip tickets right now are are less than a thousand they're only 797 and then there's the inner circle so it's not even like it's going to break you the bank to go and hear all of this amazing stuff. Cool. Who is who is right? Yeah, and so and I appreciate that too, bro. We do that on purpose. There are some other events out there that start at several thousand dollars, and we we be, I mean, obviously this this could be a huge profit center for my wife and I, um, but we choose to make it affordable because we believe in the message. My goal is not to make money on events. My goal is to incubate essentially business owners like yourselves to teach them a for purpose business model to then send you all out into the world to make the changes in your existing business or start businesses that impact the world. So it's so for us obviously there are costs associated with Thrive that we try to recover most of or even you know as much of it as we can with ticket costs etc. Uh, but uh, yeah, dude, that's another thing that we almost need to charge more because it creates confusion. Like people message me all the time, I don't get it. This is your event. It's an A A location, A plus location with A plus 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 speakers, and you're charging 300 bucks. What's the catch? It's like I just want you there. That's the catch. Come, um, but who is Thrive for? 
it's for business owners and career professionals. It's it's definitely a business conference. It's not just a motivational workshop. Uh, although you know motivation is important, they say it's it lasts about as long as a shower, and you need it every day. I like teaching people life skills that they can keep forever. And so, not to knock motivational events, I go to those two. Uh, but uh, so it's definitely a business oriented event. Um, people who own their own companies, or people who are again career professionals who work within someone else's company, but maybe in an entrepreneurial way where. You're not just doing remedial tasks. You have some say, some input, and some creative thought. We call those intrapreneurs. But that being said, that's who the event is for. But as far as the content, as far as the caliber of individual, like you just mentioned a second ago, we're looking for people that don't just want to make money. They want to make a difference. And that when we all get to our funerals, and that day comes for each of us, we're here. The Thrive is for the person that wants the attendees of their funeral to fight over the microphone to talk about the meaningful impact that we made with our lives, with the time and resources we had. I don't want anyone at my funeral to talk about my cars. And I have a great collection of cars. Those came up earlier. You know, I'm not saying it's wrong to own cars. It's just not my identity. They're just a byproduct of me working my ass off. But the reality is what I want to be remembered for and what I want people to talk about at my funeral is that I gave back. And so the caliber of individual we're looking for at Thrive is somebody who isn't ashamed of having their dream home or dream cars, but that's not what defines them and that's not the goal. It just happens organically along the way. The goal is I want to use my business as the resource or the utility to make my impact and leave my mark on the world, period. I want to make as big of a ripple effect in this earth as I can. And I believe that having abundance financially will help accelerate that movement. So I want to come to Thrive to learn how to make more money than I ever have in my life, to have more options, again, not be a better person, but have more options to do good in the world. That's who we're looking for at Thrive. Well, there was something that you have also said, Cole, and I hope I'm not in any way stealing any thunder you might have from the stage, but you've talked about if you want to make a million dollars, that's fine. But why not make two million and give a million away? And right. at this conference will will show you how to do both, how to live with that purpose, and it'll also show you how to scale your business. Because I know there's there's going to be people out there that are listening. Well, I don't need the motivation, or I don't get any value from that. I can you know get a poster of an eagle in my office. But I mean, from I'm looking at my notes. I had to grab my notebook from the original the uh, year one. And Gary Vaynerchuk, multimillionaire, has a half a billion dollar business in New York. His formula for success. Tucker Max talked about the reasons why you should write a book. We talked about types of video that you should be implementing in your business to grow your business. And I mean, the, I, I, I take pages and pages of notes every year. I say every year, but there's only been two so far. So it's it's not only the rah rah you can do it stuff. This is practical things that you can take home and implement in your business. I just want people to take away that it's not just a feel good seminar. We know the what, what is a conference? We're going to have hundreds, maybe a thousand people, dozens of, of the best speakers, business owners, charitable people, entrepreneurs in the entire world on this stage. When is it? It's roughly the last weekend of September. It's in Vegas. It's Friday through Sunday. I'll be there Wednesday night through Tuesday, I think. That's the where. And then the why. I think we've probably covered that fair, fairly thoroughly over the last few minutes. And you're out there. You got a limited budget or maybe you have an unlimited budget. I don't know everybody who listens to the Ellery Wells show, but you're thinking, is this something I should be doing? Cole, what would – I mean I, I you, you don't need to convince somebody who's on the fence – but if somebody was on the fence and you were able to just give them a blurb, what would, what would you tell them? I'd say do it. I'd say come out there and I'll tell you what. If uh, you listen to this podcast, you come out there and you didn't like it, I'll just give you your money back. It's like I'm not you know, not to sound arrogant, but I do very well in my businesses. Thrive is not a profit source for me. And so if you come out there and say I didn't learn, if you, if you can look me in the eyes and say I've learned nothing, then I'm happy to give you your money back because clearly you were not a fit. So I would say come out there and see what all the hype is about. I mean, obviously, you know, Ellery, you've had a great experience there and it's my event, so I'm biased, but just Google Thrive. I mean, on the Forbes, entrepreneur.com, uh, Huffington Post, Inc., have all had articles written that say that Thrive is the number one must attend conference in the world, period. And so it's like they can't all be wrong, right? I mean, I can be opinionated because it's mine. And Ellery maybe, you know, had a great experience. So he's a little biased too. Cool. Well, major publications have also said that 
this is the best event in the world. So I would just say, come try it and take, take a look and, and open your mind, come receptive, right. And, and just learn. And if you guys have any questions, just, you can email me too. you know, the email address, Ellery at elleriewells.com. I'll answer them. One last thing before I, I let you go, Cole. And I think we should have maybe possibly covered this. That's the most weird sentence. Maybe possibly. We maybe possibly should have covered this from the very beginning. We're, we're giving money proceeds. Last year, we built an entire school for Pencils of Promise. Can you tell us mm -hmm. what they do, why we should care, what, the, what they're doing, why you promote them? Yeah, so Pencil Promise was started by a great friend of mine. His name is Adam Braun. And Pencils of Promise does is it builds schools around the world. They're in Laos. They're in Guatemala. And they are all about education. And so they go to communities where there isn't any for children. And obviously, I believe deeply in education too. And they actually build a school. And what's really cool is as their nonprofit has advanced, they now – on their schools have solar panels on the roof and a, and an electric water purification device that runs off the solar panels. So not only is are these schools a source of education. Oh, and by the way, it, uh, when you build a school, you also have paid for one year of a teacher's salary. So these schools come with a teacher. So now the, the children in the local community are getting educated. And as they're their uh, nonprofit has evolved. That school is not now not only a source of education for these children. It's also a source of clean water in some of these countries to where, you know, you, you bring water, it gets purified through whatever device they have. And that device always works because it's running off the solar panels off the roof of these schools. And so it's, it's really cool to see the impact. And so I believe in education, I think that there are certain human rights, not talking civil rights, but human rights like uh, I think that each child has a right to an education. And so this is our way of, of helping uh, helping that and helping these kids have a, a school and a teacher to learn. I love it. Thank you for coming on the show. If you want if you want to check out the conference, it's my affiliate link at uh, elleriewells.com slash attend thrive. That will just route you to th attend thrive.com. And you can see all the things that we've talked about today. If you want the links that we've talked about, like to uh, I'll I'll try to find throat coat online the LSC <laughs> headphones and to Sevenly and there uh, those kinds of things go to elleriewellscom slash show and then find the episode there with with Cole and Cole thank you for coming on the show I look forward to seeing you again in Vegas at the end of September yeah it's just around the corner I look forward to hanging with you again thanks for having me on the show man it was great. So you know it's been a long time since I've had an interview on the Ellery Wells show and the last episode with Bridget and then this episode with Cole, they're they're here for a reason. And I realized after I, I got off the Skype call with Cole that <clears> – <throat> that this episode might come across kind of like a commercial for Thrive. And I didn't I didn't necessarily want it to be that way. And it was my fault. It has nothing to do with Cole. But it turned out that way, I think, because I believe so strongly in the conference and the message and, again, the, just the caliber of people and the quality of people and the relationships and friendships that I have made because of that conference. This year, I bought an extra ticket so Ashley can go with me. And as I just mentioned, Ashley and I will be there in the front row or two uh, with all of the other VIP ticket holders and we get access to that that special dinner on Friday night. I didn't I wanted to provide value to you and it turned out maybe more of a uh, rah rah rah, let's go to thrive together kind of thing. I hope that's all right with you. I didn't want to overly promote the event, but I, I do believe quite strongly in a few things. Number one, you need to be surrounding yourself with like-minded people or else you'll never be successful. Tough, but that's the way it is. If you, if you don't connect with people who are doing amazing things, you probably won't be able to do amazing things. Number two, I think that about every six months, you need to be attending some sort of industry conference. It's just, it's nice to check in with people. It's nice to get exposure to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And it, it just, I think that every six months is kind of the minimum. If you go too long, you lose touch, you lose contact. And this is one of those conferences that I, or one of those events, conferences or otherwise, that I would hope that you keep on your calendar for as long as Cole and his family and his team decide 
to do it. Add this along with, you know, my mastermind weekends or something like that and make sure that you are staying connected and plugged in. I also, lastly, and finally to wrap up here today, I hope you did find some some value in what Cole was saying. The th- three ways that you can incorporate some sort of altruism, giving back purpose into your business. And if you do decide to attend Thrive, you can always go to elleriewells.com slash attend Thrive, and it will take you right to the page where you can grab your tickets. I don't know how much longer the price is going to stay low before they go up again. I think there's something towards the end of August where there's a there's a price increase. So go there now as soon as you are done. Li- actually, while you're listening to this, go to elleriewells.com slash attend thrive and make sure that uh, you join us in Las Vegas this September. From Round Rock, Texas, I'm your host, Ellery Wells. Go do something awesome. <laughs>